Today we're concluding a series we began a few weeks ago. Some of you say, I didn't think it would ever be over. It was only six sermons, but man, it wore me out. Because we've talked about six lies American Christians believe. And this isn't six lies that pagans somewhere believe. It's six lies that people who name the name of Christ tend to buy into. They're they're things that just get our hooks in us, even inside the, the body of Christ, inside the church. And And they're things that the culture tells us, that your friends may tell you, but and and really the inclination of our hearts would tell us, because our hearts are sinful hearts. Uh, But it's contrary to what God's Word says. It's contrary to the will and ways of God. And so that's what we've been working on. And all those the the whole set of messages is there. And we're going to talk about some things today that are going to make you maybe a little uncomfortable. And I'll just tell you. No matter how uncomfortable these things make you feel, it will still be easier than listening to Jimmy talk about sex again, like we did a few weeks ago. So this will be much easier for you, okay? Now, today we're talking about line number six, God makes life easy. And, and here's, how, here's how I'll frame up this conversation. The idea, and this is, this is maybe the most prominent false teaching in, in our country, when it comes to Christian things, definitely worldwide, it's all over. It's, it's called the prosperity gospel. And here's the idea, that if, if you kind of love God, and you're basically a pretty good person, God's job, His responsibility, is to make your life happy, carefree, and always working out the way you think it ought to work out. And if it doesn't work that way, the idea is God fell down on his job somewhere. I had a conversation this last week with someone going through some difficulties, and we were working through that, talking about the difficulties. And this person, uh, at the end of this conversation, I said, could, could I just pray for you? And, and they said, well, I don't know what good it'll do. I've been praying, and it hasn't all changed. And that's, that's where the prosperity gospel leads, that, well, it should always be easy. It should always be carefree. God's job is, is to make it the way I want it to be. And if it doesn't work out that way, what happens? We're kind of disappointed with God. God, you fell down on the job. God, you need to get on the stick. God, you need, to, you need to take care of business. And when life becomes hard or harsh or painful... We think uh, the rug's been pulled out from under us and God's not doing his job and people walk away from church and they walk away from the Christian faith and they close up their Bibles because because they're disappointed with God. And the prosperity gospel, well, that's, that's how it frames things up and that's where that road leads. And this lie, this particular lie of the six may be the hardest one for us to break free from. And the reason, uh, well, a couple of reasons I want to touch on. The first one is... This particular lie, lie number six, it appeals to the selfishness of our own hearts. It just works against the way that we're wired as people. And we think about us and ours. And, and so, this lie is attractive. That our natural desires are, and it's not a terrible thing to say, I want to be healthy. I want to be comfortable. I, I want to... I want life to work out the way I think it ought to work out. And that's the way our hearts are wired. And, and that's why it's hard to, to, to break free. The, it's a, it's, and I say prosperity gospel. It's gospel with a really, really small G. Not the gospel at all. But that's, that's how it's presented. And it's, it's not a gospel that says you should deny yourself anything. It's not a gospel that says you should take up your cross and follow him. It's, it's not a gospel where you say, uh, you have to die to yourself. It's not that kind of gospel at all. It's, a, it's definitely a lesser gospel. Uh, you know, we live in these United States of America, and we are much blessed living here. Absolutely, we are blessed, and we're grateful. And you ought to thank God for it. You ought to celebrate it. You know, hashtag blessed, right? But hashtag blessed is not, is not, life's working out the way I think it should. Things are good. Everything's up and to the right. Hashtag blessed. And 
That blessing just flows right into the cul-de-sac of my life. And I'm, I'm happy and healthy and good and everything's the way I think it ought to work. See, that's, that's, it's not hashtag blessed into my cul-de-sac. It's hashtag blessed that I might be a blessing. That I might be a conduit of the love and the grace and the power of God beyond myself into this world. That's why God blesses. Not just so I can have a lot of great stuff. As wonderful as it is. And thank God for what you have and where you are and what you experience as an American Christian. But God, you bless me that I might be a blessing. It's tough to share the gospel with people who've bought into the prosperity gospel. Because you're asking them to deny what seems the American dream. That uh, it ought to always work out the way you think it should work out. Life should flow the way you think it should flow. And we're calling people to forsake, to turn their backs on a belief that really appeals to the selfish nature of sinful people. And exchange that belief that really scratches you where you itch kind of thing. To, to something that is completely, completely different. To a life of, of sacrifice and commitment. Surrender. Now here's another thing about the prosperity gospel that makes it tough. They use the same words we do, but they have a different meaning. Here's what I mean by that. Let's take the word faith. Okay, when I use the word faith, I mean a gift God has given me to believe His word is true and Jesus is the Christ. That's faith. Well, when the prosperity gospel folks, small g gospel, use the word faith, they, they talk about it like it's a tool. That you, you use the tool of faith to get God to do what you want. You, you contractually obligate Him because, you know, if you have enough faith, if you believe it hard enough, then God's going to fix it, make it right, and do it the way you want it done. And He has to because you had so much faith. And that's a lesser God and a lesser gospel. Another word that pops up, the word gospel itself. Now, when I use the word gospel, I mean the good news of Jesus Christ. The sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of the world, placed in a tomb, raised from the dead, ascended back into heaven, coming again on the clouds of glory. That's what I talk about when I talk about the gospel, and that through faith in Him, believing that what He did at the cross paid for my sin, by surrendering my life to Him, I have a hope and I have a future. I have forgiveness of right now, relationship to God right now, eternal life assured one of these days. That's what I mean by the gospel. What they mean by the gospel, and gospel means good news. Many of you know that. Gospel, euangelion. Gospel means good news. But they mean the good news that God's will for your life and desire for your heart is that you be healthy, wealthy, and successful. And that's a lesser gospel. I want to read a story, and then we're going to talk about this story, and then we're going to make some applications. Here's uh, the story from Luke chapter 10. This is one of the most familiar stories in literature. And certainly in the Bible, it's the story of the Good Samaritan. So here's what happens. Verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. Say, so I hope you have your Bible open. You'll keep it open. Uh, use your electronic device. Uh, here we go. And behold, Luke says, a lawyer. He was a specialist in the law of the the law, the the, the scriptural law, and the ceremonial law primarily. A lawyer stood up to put him to the test, put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? We actually spent one of our life Sundays on that idea. It's all about what I do. I can earn it. I can deserve it. I can, I can manipulate God and eternity to make it work out for me. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How, how do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus said to this lawyer, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. That's a good answer. But he, the lawyer, verse 20, 29, desiring to justify himself. You ever need to justify yourself? 
We're experts at justifying ourselves. We're experts at, well, here's why I did it that way. Here's how I think it should work. Desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus told a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So also a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, this isn't even one of God's chosen people. He's a Samaritan. As he journeyed, came to where he was, where the man was by the side of the road. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and, and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. So which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? No, the lawyer said, well, the one who showed him mercy. Uh, a clear answer to a simple question. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Let's look at this guy. He is traveling on the road, the Jerusalem to Jericho road. And uh, it's just a dangerous place. It wasn't a secret that it was a dangerous place. It was well known it was a dangerous place. It's a narrow gully. Lots of places for thieves to hide. If you had anything worth stealing, this was a great place to, to be robbed. And uh, if you were a thief, it was a great place to do business. What did he have? Well, apparently one of the things he had was clothes. Remember, this is, we're going to talk about third world people in a moment. Well, this is a third world environment. Most of the people, they're not going to have but one change of clothes. They're going to wear those clothes for a few days. Then they'll wash them, put on the other clothes. They'll wear those for a few days. That's, that's the nature of the environment. So, here they are. They take his clothes, took whatever else he had too, I suppose, but it says they took his clothes and beat him, left him half dead. Now, this man, we might say, had nobody to blame but himself for his situation because it wasn't a secret that the road between Jerusalem and Jericho was a dangerous place. And we don't know why he was by himself. Maybe he just wasn't a good thinking guy. Maybe he... He's one of those people who thought, well, sure, it could happen to somebody else, but not to me. Maybe it was an impulsive decision that he made because there was a crisis he had to meet and he didn't have time to get someone to go with him. So the strength in numbers on a dangerous road. Maybe, maybe someone uh, canceled out at the last minute who was planning to go with him. We don't know what the circumstances were. Maybe he's reckless. Maybe he's foolhardy. But... Often, when we have someone who runs into crisis and it's clear you shouldn't have done what you did, and now you're experiencing the consequences of it, we say, well, he got what he asked for. The reason he's having a hard time is because he's probably not as good a person as I am, not as smart as I am, uh, not living as well as I live. Today in our world, there are a lot of people that could be classified as Jericho Road type people. And their lives are just this, this wreck on, on life's highway, we'd say. And, and they're beaten and they're bruised. And how'd they get there? Well, sometimes they've been victimized by a cruel, harsh world. And sometimes the people whose lives get wrecked, they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's, man, circumstances just converged in a terrible way on their life. And Sometimes they're there because of their own bad choices. They have invited disaster into their life. There are consequences to the choices we make. And sometimes we find people on the Jericho Road that they, uh, they have, we, we say, you reap what you have sown. They've just planted seeds of destruction and it's all come to roost. And they're, they're, they're harvesting now the, the consequences of choices they've made. And sometimes... And sometimes, people are just born in the wrong country. 
no fault of their own. They, they lost the nation of origin lottery. And they weren't born in the United States of America. They were born into a country and into a circumstance of poverty and disease and a lack of educational opportunity and spiritual darkness. And that's just the nature of their existence. Now, as followers of Jesus Christ, walking through uh, Jericho roads, we're called on in this parable to reach out and to care about those people that maybe nobody else cares about. To the wounded, the forgotten, the misplaced, the ignored. Sometimes we, we say the last, the least, the lost, the lonely. The people that just fall through the cracks. The people who are forgotten. The most vulnerable peoples in the world, which are children. And we reach out in the name of a loving, caring Savior. The question Jesus asked the lawyer, or the, the lawyer asked, you know, who is my neighbor? Uh, <laughs> if... If you stop by the guy beaten and bloodied on the, on the road and you said, Hey, buddy, I got a question for you. Who's your, who's your neighbor? I think he wouldn't have had a hard time answering the question. He'd say, Anybody who cares, anybody who'll stop, anybody who'll do something at some level to, to meet some need in my life. For us... Our, our neighbor is anyone, anywhere with a need. I came across this quote several years ago. It says, being a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, requires much more than, than just having a personal transforming relationship with God. It also entails a public transforming relationship with our world. That it's not this self-contained thing that as long as me and mine are okay, I have done everything that it means to be a Christian. But see, if, if you know Jesus, there are things that, that start flowing out of that life that, that are tangible, visible, measurable. There's stuff that happens when you belong to Jesus, and it reaches beyond me and mine into our world. If, if your personal faith in Christ, and this is lies American Christians believe, if your personal faith in Christ, if it had, a lot of people, they say, well, it, it doesn't have any positive outward expression, any biblical outward expression. Well, if it doesn't, then your faith, my faith, if that's true, there, there's just a, there's a leak in it at best. That something's missing that ought to be there. Something, something that ought to be tangible is, is not. In James, he wrote about that kind of person. They say, well, I'm a Christian, but there's not anything that shows, that demonstrates it, that's living it, that's measurable, observable. He says, someone will say, well, you know, you have faith and I have works. James says, and this is, I read James this morning in preparation for this day. And so I have several James verses today. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. When there's a faith, a saving faith, there's some things that are going to happen as a result of that life. The gospel is so much more than, than this private transaction between us and God. It's a life and a mission to, that we carry to the world. And, and worship's not, a, not enough. And basic morality is not enough. And it's not enough just to, well, I'm, I'm for or against all the right and wrong things when it comes to my political views. God, God's always called for more. I, I consume a lot of news. Sometimes I, I think I probably, and, and I'll take days where I, I fast from news. And uh, might might do a lot of us good just to take a break from it every once in a while. And the madness in our world uh, just now. But I, I consume a lot of news and I read stories, I hear stories, watch stories of wars and famine and disease and extreme poverty in our world and you know, a response, if there is a response, because it's so many things are just so overwhelming, is, is limited to, I'll sure pray about that. Oh, I'll fire off a, a quick prayer. Dear God, please help those poor people in, in, in that terrible place. And God, they need to know that you love them. And 
Boy, pray, pray for your world. Make it a matter of prayer for, for your Jerusalem, your Judea, your Samaria, and your ends of the earth. You pray for your world. And when God brings a need to mind, you need to take it to the Lord in prayer. But, but consciously or unconsciously, the other part of that is sometimes we say, what an overwhelming need. God, please help those people to know you love them. But I'm going to priest and Levite my way over here to the other side of the road. Because... Uh, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to deal with that. And I don't think there's really anything tangible I can, I can truly do about that. And, uh, and somewhere in there, there is that verbalized or not, thank you, God. And oh, thank you, God, for the life you're allowed to live in this country. Thank you, God that I'm not that guy because his life stinks. Good luck with all that. And we walk on past on the other side of the road. Uh, hashtag blessed, right? Not that guy. Hashtag blessed. Prayer is a great place to start, but, but we can't stop there. Here's what James says, a couple of verses. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, by the way, that doesn't say if they need to know Jesus. Uh, that, that's sort of assumed with a lot of things with James. Uh, th- these are just basic human need things. Poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. And one of you says this, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Wow, that's a little more. I use the word your faith has a leak. Uh, James just says, just dead as a hammer. Then Jesus was teaching about the final judgment. Uh, this from Matthew 25. And this is what Jesus said. It's an illustration. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? Where, where do we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And, and the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. Uh, I, did, uh, I did a quick search th- this morning just out of curiosity. I'd seen one of these lists recently and I just checked again. So you version, multiple versions of the Bible. Many of you are on a you version Bible reading plan. Well, you version keeps all kinds of stats. And one of those stats are the most searched for verses in the Bible. Sometimes by reference, sometimes by keywords, but the most searched for verses in the Bible. Do you know that none of that that I just read shows up in the top ten? Yeah. You know the verses that are most searched for? The ones that say, God loves you. He's for you. He's going to bless you. He's going to take care of you. And man, I love those verses. Those are the ones that we like to put on plaques in our houses, right? Not many people are looking for this. These are inconvenient truths to a lot of, to a lot of people who say, I'm a Christian. But this kind of gets into my business and makes me do something uh, uncomfortable maybe for me. Here's one of the reasons why. Susan Moeller wrote a book several years ago that I read called Compassion Fatigue. And uh, she wrote that if we're really honest with ourselves, we have to admit we just have less empathy. We're, we're less moved emotionally for people of other cultures living far away than we feel it for uh, Americans. And she says that our compassion for others is directly related to whether people are close to us, whether they're like us. And you understand what that means, that if they're like us uh, socially, emotionally, culturally, ethnically, economically, geographically, people who are close to us, we just feel it more when when there's there's a need and we respond stronger when it's like us, close to us. And it's not hard to 
find examples of this. Uh, so I'm an American. Most of you are Americans. And in, uh, in our country, there, there are days on the calendar that it's Christmas. All right. It's New Year's. All right. But during the last several years now, when it gets to be September the 11th, we all, we all kind of pull up for a while and we think about it and we remember. Because on American soil, just barely under 3,000 Americans died and 6,000 severely injured on a day in a terrorist attack on our country. And we feel 9-11. And we feel, and, and, and to the point that we remember it every year. We don't have to be reminded. It doesn't have to show up on a calendar. Oh, yeah, I remember. We all remember when it gets to be September 11th. Those were Americans. And over the last five or six years, there's been a civil war in Syria. And some of you may follow this a little bit. Some of you, lesser degree. But in Syria, during the civil war, 250,000 people, somewhere around a third of them children, have died in that civil war. Four and a half million people are refugees, Syrian refugees. And we talk about that. We say, oh man, you know those Syrian refugees because some of them are terrorists. And, you know, I don't have any reason to doubt that some of them are. But not four and a half million of them. And in fact, a few million of them are children. And the reason they're refugees, no, why don't they just stay where they are? Because there's not even an electrical system that works in the places where they were. And there's not even a water system that works anymore where they were. And so when it gets to that point, you just have to pick up and go somewhere else. Well, why don't they just go back to work? Because work's blown all to pieces. There's not a work to go back to. And there aren't fields to be cultivated because there's a war going on all around them. And so they got to go somewhere. And so they are going. And, you know, there's a story. But that doesn't touch us too deeply. You know why? Because they're not Americans. They're not us. They're a different culture, different religion. There are a lot of things about them that don't connect as much with, with us. Bring it closer to home. You can hear, you hear these stories. You know, thousands of children dying annually in car accidents. You know, in our country. These are Americans. So you, you hear it and you go, oh man, that's just so sobering. Thousands of kids dying in car accidents every year. And th that bothers me. And you know, and I pray, God, all those families that are affected so deeply by, by this. But you're not going to worry about it too long when you hear that story. You come across that news item. But... If your neighbor and your kids play with their kids, if your neighbor's child is killed in a car wreck, suddenly it's a different deal, right? Now it's coming close to home. And you're going to rush over there and you're going to care about that family and you're going to try to do all you can to minister to them and you're going to take food to their house and you're going to pray with them and for them. You're going to do everything you can to try to help them. Okay, let's take another step. What if it's your house? What if it's your family? It's your child. It will change. It will it will redirect your life. It will change you forever when that crisis comes in that close. But the thing is, the more distant the tragedy is, the, the less it touches our hearts. You know, I hear stories about starving African children dying by the thousands. And, and right now, in, uh, from, kind, of, kind of from Nairobi, Kenya, all the way to the Indian Ocean, uh, they're in a... They're in a long-term drought and they've lost multiple harvests now and so there's somewhere in the neighborhood of three million people who are in danger of severe malnutrition and starvation if this continues on and the rain didn't come to that area this year and there's a rainy season and it passed them by again and you say wow that's terrible but you're probably not going to lose a lot of sleep over what's happening in uh, eastern Kenya I know some people in eastern Kenya Talk back and forth on a weekly basis with some of those people. It's a little more personal for me because of a connection I have. Most of us, uh, you know, some African child is dying of poverty and disease and famine. 
But what if you walk out your front door this morning and you open up your front door and there's a little African girl there who is starving and sick and she just laid out on your, uh, your Pinterest-driven welcome mat. And now it's a little different, right? Now, now Africa and starvation came to your house. And you gather up that little girl and you're going to get her all the help you can get. You're going to get her to medical care and you're going to do all you can to make a difference. Because it's not somebody on the other side of the world that's different from me. It's somebody maybe still different from me, but they're sitting at my house. And they're a name and they're a face. And it's personal. Like it was for the Good Samaritan. I have to do something. There are things I can do personally. And, you know, for me, because I have some contacts in some of these places, there's some things that Rhonda and I do personally in these places. And some of you have relationships because you've been to third world countries where there are these great needs. And you can personally do some stuff. It's awesome. But I'm going to get to the end of what I can do quickly from here to there. Because I'm just a guy in North Texas. And so for a lot of the things we do internationally as a church, we need partners. We have a lot of partners in ministry. And they help us with different things that we can't do by ourselves. We, you need a specialist for some of your medical needs. You need a specialist for some of your ministry needs. And Compassion International is one of those specialists that our church partners with. It's a way to partner with people who live in faraway places who have great needs. And what they do is they help make it personal. Because it's not just, there's a child somewhere else who's in crisis. But they bring it to your doorstep because there, there's a child. And with compassion, they have a face. And they have a name. And you know where they live. And then it's not just far away. Dear God, help those far away people. Now it's personal. And now it's person. Not just a big sweeping need and children are the most vulnerable in the world and what compassion does is they enable us to do something by partnering with them do something Christ honoring life changing sustainable in sponsoring a child I want you to learn a little more about compassion we have a two minute video watch the story Tragedy came to our lives when uh, my father, who was only 25 years old, passed away. My mother told me that my father had a passion to bring uh, compassion to the community. My name is Sammy Orlando. I am from Luperon, Dominican Republic. For a Dominican family, a father means provision and it means protection. And uh, I had just lost that provision. I was forced by life basically to go on the streets. Uh, A five-year-old on the street, I was just struggling in life trying to make it. I thought I was gonna be probably a drug addict, uh, a thief. I wanted to become a musician, but I didn't think I was gonna do it. And I felt abandoned. I was losing my dream and I needed an opportunity. And that opportunity was given to me when God, he used a ministry called Compassion International. My mother, she remarried a pastor, and they were able to bring compassion to that community. My sponsor decided to choose me, to sponsor me. She wrote letters to me saying, Samuel, it is possible to believe. It is possible to dream again. It is possible to have hope. You could become whoever you wanted to be. I was able to get uniforms. I was able to get school supplies, was able to get meals. My father believed in a ministry like Compassion and changed my life. I am grateful to that. I will always be grateful to Compassion and mostly grateful to God because I know God is using ministries like this to change lives. Today, I am a recording engineer. Today, I am a singer and a musician. My wife and I decided to sponsor to kids, one in the Dominican Republic and one in Haiti because it's not enough being blessed We have to be a blessing. My name is Samuel Orlando, and I am a life changed.
See, that's, that's just a snapshot of one life. But you need a little bit more than a, than a snapshot today. So I would like to introduce you to Samuel Orlando. Samuel, welcome. Uh, Samuel, uh, so, so we get two minutes, and that's a, so your whole life in two minutes. By the way, isn't he, he's a lot better looking here than he is on screen, isn't he? Oh, Live yeah. boy. Uh, so I'd like to hear more of the before compassion comes a long story, and then I want to hear a little more about the, the after compassion and just the, what difference does it make in a life? Yes, well, thank you so much for having me here. It's been a pleasure. And uh, i just uh, like to share a story. In an afternoon in, in my country, my mother and I had to move to the east and live with my uncle. And that was because we could not afford a house. Uh, and that afternoon, he came from his job. And uh, his children and I went running towards him, yelling, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy's here. I used to call my uncle Daddy. Uh, and then one of my cousins stopped me and told me, Samuel, you stop calling him Dad. Because he's not your dad. Your dad is dead. And they used to tell me that many times. But that specific day actually hit me very hard. So I went by running to my mother and I asked my mother, Mommy, why did God take away my father? She didn't have any answers. My father was only 25 years old. When he passed away, he was a pastor. And I was only six months. And I didn't have the chance to meet him. My mother was 23. He became a widow. And we didn't have anything. Um, it was, the church was a, you know, barely starting. So because of the absence of my father, it has to, I have to leave, you know, dealing with something I call a monster because to me it's a monster, the monster of poverty. And when we talk to our children here in the U.S. about poverty, it's kind of difficult to explain to them because they don't understand. My son sometimes opens the refrigerator and says, there's nothing to eat here, and it's full of food, you know. And they think, oh, we're poor because we have nothing to eat. He may, did, he may be thinking, oh, poverty is not only an iPhone or an iPad or for some people here in the U.S., poverty means not owning a house or making the minimum wage. But for people like my mother and I, poverty meant that we were not sure if we were going to have breakfast in the morning. We were not if we were going to have lunch or dinner. That was poverty to us. Poverty to me was going to the streets at the age of five and become the provider of my house. So I had to work. I had a bucket in my head yelling cornbread, cornbread, pan de maíz. Who would like to be a cornbread? I was a cornbread seller. And there's, I remember, you know, these people coming to me, laughing at me, telling me, you're just a comrade seller. And while I saw the kids playing, I was actually working. And that was my life. Poverty to me was a liar because poverty used to tell me that I was good for nothing, that I was worthless, hopeless. Poverty told me that God abandoned me. That was poverty to me. Remember this specific day, um, my mom and I, we didn't have anything to eat in the house and... Uh, we were Christians, so we were praying, God, can you please provide something for us today? And then all of a sudden, a sweet lady from church showed up with 10 plantains. Those, you know, don't know, plantain is like green bananas and two eggs. And I was literally jumping, saying, wow, God just provided for us. He gave us food. And then all of a sudden, my mother started dividing those plantains, saying, these two are for Sister Mary, these two for Sister Luz. And I was starting to worry about it because she was giving away our blessing. I told mom, what's going on? You're giving her away. And then she said patiently, Samuel, it is better to give than to receive. She was trying to teach me lessons. And then after that, I started to say that God always provides. And people say, amen, God always provides. But some people also come to me and tell me, if God always provides, why is there poverty in the world? If God is good, why is there poverty in the world? If God always provides, why are there 400 million children right now living in extreme poverty, not knowing what they're going to eat the next day, not having clean water? Nine-year-old little girls in Haiti prostituting themselves to get something out of it, to get clean water, for example, after the earthquake. Why? And I tell them, God always provides. The problem is that we are not always willing to share to our neighbors what God always provides. And I was going to school, pastor, with sometimes broken, broken shoes, barely any school supplies, sometimes an empty stomach. Sometimes I had to go to work if we had corn to make cornbread. And I had dreams. I wanted to become a recording engineer, a musician, a singer, and I wanted to preach the gospel because my mother told me that was my father's dream. 
But poverty, again, the liar told me that it couldn't be possible, that I was nobody, and that I was probably going to end up, like my friends, dealing with drugs, stealing, because there's poverty, there's corruption, there's prostitution, there's sex trafficking. That's what happens where there's poverty in third world country. But I praise God because God was never late. I usually say that God is never late, and people say amen because God is never late. But when I say that God is never early either, people kind of like, hmm. <laughs> and when I read Matthew 28, verse 20, the last verse, portion of verse that I, that I read, and it says, I am with you always. You know, if God was late in my life or early, that means that he wasn't there, that he had to leave. But God has been with me all the time. He's always been there for me. But sometimes I didn't understand why. And God showed me that he was there for me, and he used a person to show me that he was there for me and showed me his love. Her name was Terry, and that was the name of my sponsor. And I used to have, Terry sent me her picture, and I used to show it up, say, this is my white sponsor. And I was so proud of it. And I could not understand how a person from Canada wanted to invest her time in me. Not just her money, $38 a month, but the time to write letters to me and tell me that she loved me. And tell me that she was praying for me and sending me Bible verses and telling me that empowering me with her words and taking the time. I could not understand that. I never met Terry. She never traveled to the Dominican Republic. But her letters meant the world to me. They changed my life. And being able to go to the Compassion Program, you probably never heard about Compassion. I'll tell you that it is a true Christ-centered ministry that releases children from poverty in Jesus' name. They do that exclusive to local churches in 26 different countries. Last year alone, more than 138,000 children came to Christ through Compassion International. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Yes, I would Amen. do that. And this is because people like you, churches here in the U.S., partner with Compassion and want to become good Samaritans and change lives. Because for some of those children, some of those people, the only hope they have it's actually literally the local church people like you that can give them a chance, an opportunity. So Terry decided to partner and give me an opportunity. And I received meals, school supplies, uniforms, the teachings of Jesus Christ and the empowerment from the local church telling me that I could become a blessing. Because my thing is, it was not just to, become, to be blessed, but I was wondering if God could use a comrade teller. I was wondering that. And the local church told me, yes, you can. And my sponsor just said, yes, you can. And because of that, today I am a recording engineer, a musician, and a singer. And I preach the gospel around the world. Isn't that Amen. amazing? Amen. I praise God for that. Amen. From Selling Comrade, I'm currently working on my master's degree in organizational leadership. And I sponsor two kids. And my wife and I go back to DR every year. And here it is. Here it is. And just... Just listen, how, how we could empower somebody. My wife and I go back to the yard, and we bring 1,000 backpacks, over 1,000 backpacks, with school supplies to the children in the community. We bring my band, and we do a concert for free. We preach the gospel. Like hundreds of people are coming to Christ. This is only one person. So that's what happens when you decide to become a good Samaritan and empower somebody else. Today, you may be able to sponsor and empower the next lawyer, the next doctor, the next, who knows, maybe the next president of one of these countries, you could do that. And you could do that in Jesus' name. But you may be hesitating today, saying, should I sponsor a child? Does the money really go to them? And I tell you, yes, yes, it does. Minimum 80% of, your invest, of, the, of what you send gets to them, minimum. And Compassion usually does 84%, 86%. It goes to the child. It's, it's Christian ministry. And you may be hesitating, should I sponsor today? Maybe I'm, I'm not sure about it. And I want to close with this quick story that hope, hopefully God may inspire you to do something today, to make your, work, your, your faith, you know, be alive. I went back to the ER one time, and um, a friend of ours forgot her backpack in my house, and I felt to put $20 inside the backpack. I wasn't sure if it was God or if it was just me, so I needed to think about it. And, you know, I've been in church for so long, I said, you know, let me just pray about it. But, you know, praying about it is great. I have to pray, and I love praying. But sometimes I use that phrase to get rid of people when they're asking me for something. And you probably use that too, right? <laughs> you know, so I was like, you know, God, I'm just going to pray about it. I'm just not sure. The next day she came to her house. She came back. She said, yesterday I needed money to complete the rent. She's a 23-year-old girl 
with three kids still trying to make it to high school. She said, I was being kicked out of the place because I didn't have the money to pay the rent. And somebody gave it to me. And I felt very happy because she was blessed by that. She needed help. At the same time, I felt very sad inside my heart because I knew that God wanted to use Samuel Orlando. God wanted to use me to be a blessing. And he had to use somebody else. Because God will accomplish his purpose either through me or through somebody else. And after that, I said, God, whenever you show me a need, I'm not going to think about it or pray about it. I am going to act about it. Hmm. Not just because out of pity or because somebody is manipulating me or just pushing me hard to do something. No. The Good Samaritan will need, need to have to be pushed. I mean, the other two guys or the other three guys, they saw the need over there. Yeah, there's a need. Bless you. And they left. But the Good Samaritan just didn't feel bad about it because sometimes, oh, wow, well, these poor children living in extreme poverty. You know, feelings doesn't take you anywhere. It doesn't do anything. Now, conviction, faith, and saying, God, I want to be used. I want to become a blessing. I want to be a good Samaritan. That's something else. Today, you have the same chance, the same opportunity. The last service, we have 30 good Samaritans that sponsored 30 kids. And we praise God for that. But you know what? I think there's the possibility that more than 30 people today you know, if you can, if you have the power to do it, make the decision of love to say, you know what? I'm going to release a child from poverty. Maybe you could meet the child. You, could, you, you have the potential to do that. You have, may be able to travel and see what God is doing in their family. You could write letters. It's amazing. $38 a month. That's $1.25 a day. That's a coffee, less than a coffee. Let's not, not even talk about Starbucks. <laughs> but you have maybe the potential to do that today. The question here to you is, are you willing to bless your neighbor today and become a blessing? Not just hashtag blessed, but hashtag be a blessing. So I want to thank you so much, Pastor, for opening the doors, for allowing me to share my story, and for being part of this beautiful ministry. And God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brother. Amen. Amen. How many of you have already been through the Compassion Experience? Uh, hey, that's good. You need more of you to go through. It's fascinating. It's open, uh, it'll open up here in a few minutes, and uh, it'll run through this evening, and then it'll run all day tomorrow. And it's just great to walk through because it just gives you, it gives you a little more of a, the feel of what it means to grow up in a third world country and the story of a couple of children uh, who have been touched by the Ministry of Compassion. How many of you are already sponsoring a child? I mean, today or recently or, yeah, excellent, good, good, I pre and I appreciate you, you're such a generous people, and thanks for being a giver of hope and help. I appreciate Compassion as a partner in our gospel ministry, because they do bring the world to our doorstep, they make it, they make it uh, doable, uh, they, to, uh, in a tangible way, to touch places far away from here, and that's, that's the amazing part of the work, and it's sustainable and it carries over and it makes such a tremendous difference for all eternity in the life of a child and a family. Because it's not just the child, it's the family around them that can be transformed as well through this process. My favorite part with compassion, there, there are lots and lots of ministries who do uh, child sponsorship. There, there are Christian ministries, non-Christian ministries do child sponsorship. The reason that compassion is here is because of how they do it, which is different than everybody else. It all happens in the context of a local church. That if it's, if it's meeting their health care needs, those educational needs, if it, if it is uh, a healthy meal that they're going to have on a daily basis, the kid comes to the church to do that. Because also there's a group of faith-filled believers wrapped around them at a local church who are also going to be pointing them to Jesus with each one of those things. And that's what makes compassion different from everybody else. So... As Christians, you know, we can't just stick our heads in the sand, pretend the world's okay because we're okay. That uh, our problems, which are, we're talking about first world problems, they're not such big problems, truly. And we can't be like the priest and the Levite walking by the suffering on the other side of the road because these are our neighbors. And it is overwhelming 
to think about the needs in the world. And, and I feel that too. And in that overwhelming feeling, there are three things to remember. The first thing, every one of those hurting people is loved by God, created in the image of God. And every one of them has, every one of them is facing great challenges and there are solutions to those problems. And every one of us can make a difference. Christians like to, like to uh, misquote the Bible. There are all kinds of things that Christians, people who go to church their whole lives will say that, that aren't true. And say, well, you know what the Bible says. The Bible says that, this is my favorite misquote, so I don't want to misquote it. God will never give you more than you can handle. You heard that before? God will never give you. There's hardly a week goes by in ministry that I don't interact with people that somebody doesn't say, you know what the Bible says? God, I'm going through all these problems, but God will never give you more than you can handle. Do you know where that's found in the Bible? It's not found in the Bible at all. In fact, the truth of God's word is God will always give you more than you can handle. Always. He's going to put you in a spot where you have to believe in Him. You have to trust Him. You're going to be in the realm of faith instead of self-sufficiency. God will always give you more than you can handle. And so that, that's a misquote from the Bible. But we'll apply it to third world people. Well, you know, God, God's not going to give them more than they can handle. And so here we are. Dealing with hungry, diseased, impoverished people. And many of them also have an inclination toward Christ. Or maybe they're already faithful believers. And they love the Lord. In fact, they love the Lord like the Bible says to love the Lord. Instead of the casual way that we go at it so often. But these folks, they're, they're dying. They're dying of hunger while we're trying to find new and creative and more exciting ways to, to lose weight. And to have weight uh, loss gimmicks. We, they're dying while, of diseases of diseases that we've had cures for in this country for two to four generations. And a lot of these people, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're certainly created in the image of God. And, and they're people Jesus died on the cross to save. And so James said in James 4 chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 17 remember it is a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. Who is my neighbor? Here we are in uh, Allen, Texas today. And we know the needs. And we have the ability to make a difference. And what happens next determines what we really believe about God. Not the platitudes. Not the plaque on your wall that says, here's what, the way God is and here's how it works. What do you really believe? And what does God expect from us in this? Well, same thing as always. Jesus is Lord. Which means he expects everything. Everything. He wants all of it. He wants your whole, your whole life. I, I'm going to always want to challenge you toward generosity. And you have meant so many of you have taken such huge steps in generosity. And as God has blessed you, that you might be a blessing. And you have laid hold of that truth. And, and I'm so thankful for it. Here's what happens. That prosperity gospel that it's all about me and mine. Every time you're generous, Satan's hold on you with that stuff just breaks a little bit and this lie just falls to the wayside. And that's what we want to accomplish in this.